it's Genesis, it's the last domino. We are sort of revisiting a past, I think. Genesis spent months touring arenas. Then when the warm weather hit, their fans followed them outdoors. Everywhere they play, they take the audience by storm. In the days of progressive rock, they were underground pioneers. Genesis is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, prog band ever. The last year, they were voted number one live band in the world. This is the only band I've ever been with. We formed it when I was only 17. Anyone that is a real first-class performer, it's a drug that you can't get anywhere else. The adoration, that, that connection with people, with an audience. You've got to have a lot of luck. That's the main ingredient of all this stuff. Sometimes things just happen for us in the world. Be the last, probably is the last run of it, you know what I mean? An important moment for us and for the, anyone who likes the band. I would hate it if nobody got to see this because it's such an important thing to a lot of people, but you know, what's the point in kind of dwelling about that because it's not in our control really? I remember that last show we did on the last 07 tour, the Hollywood Bowl. Phil was kind of signing off. I didn't really want to be in a band anymore. Uh, at the, you know, at, at the end of the 2007 tour, I remember going on stage in Los Angeles, which at that point was going to be the last show, and, you know, telling Mike and Tony that I loved them in front of, you know, this is on stage. And, um... But, but that would be it, you know. <laughs> it kind of felt like I was more serious if I said it in front of people. <laughs> but, uh, you know, here we are. So this is very much a family group. We've grown up together. And I've never said it publicly or privately, but Tony, I love him. <laughs> Mike, I love you too. And now being British, we're going to carry on with things. That's enough of that. When Phil left the band, I thought maybe that's, that's it. I might retire, you know, I just forget it, do something else. I'm like, you know, I was, I was never sure I was going to be a musician all my life, but then what kept me going a little bit was switching to doing orchestral music, which actually seemed to go down pretty well, even with, with quite some of the classical people. So I was inspired me to carry on, really, and then obviously we had to the next Genesis tour. People we suggested, we met, we thought, we talked about it. There'd been a lot of talk about doing something with Peter, and Peter was always oh my and ahhing and stuff. So, so in the end, we just said, look, why don't we just do the three of us? And that's why we did that last tour. Hollywood Bowl, Phil was kind of signing off, you know, on stage. He very strictly said, I love Michael Turner, love these guys, you know, and sort of signing off. <laughs> Here we are now. <laughs> I'm not saying in 14, 17 years' time, we'll be doing the same thing again. Um, that's, something, that's something we really worry about, I think. We did the tour in 2007. And it was kind of, we kind of felt there was a bit of unfinished business still. At that point, Phil was considering giving up because of his, his problems with his, with his foot and his leg. And also he was having real problems with playing drums. And Mike was quite involved with mechanics at the time as well. But I think we all felt at the same time that it was a bit of unfinished business. So that was one thing. And then secondly, you know, Phil got back on the road and became a singer as opposed to the drummer. And he's on his solo career. Mike joined him on, on the European tour with the mechanics supporting him in stadium shows and, and joined Phil on stage doing Follow You, Follow Me. That was kind of the, the key that, that unlocked the door. All credit to Mike, he didn't let go of that. He kept pushing it and said, we should really do something. We've had enough fame and success, you know what I mean, over, over the years to satisfy anyone, especially me. So this is something... Um, what we do, and we're good friends, and I think uh, the other things we do well. 
couple of bands like the Floyd have got a couple of huge albums, The Wall and Dark Side, and Fleetwood Mac got Rumours. You know, certain bands have classic albums, which are always their, their sort of pinnacle, which is always remembered. We never had a classic album. We always had a lot of albums, all bit different. With the fans, especially in the UK, the kind of the emotion and the passion for the band is very strong. The punters, so this will feel special. I think. We decided this a year or two ago that we might do this. I don't know really. I mean, why not? In a way, I mean, if, if people still want to see us, I'm very proud of all the music we've done, and it's a great opportunity to play it. We got together in January of this year, 2020, and it went very well. The two weeks in New York that we did do, to me, even though we haven't been together since 2007, it doesn't feel like 12 years. It feels like 12 months. I suppose January was, was a tryout all around, you know. It was kind of weird, because we were trying, learning the songs, to rehearse them, to see if we were going to play them. And for a couple of hours, and, and then not quite sure if we are actually going to come to life afterwards. But that was always part of the sort of approach. I definitely think that the January rehearsals, as well as seeing if the band could do it, I think for me, at least, I felt like it was a, a, an audition thing. You know, with Chester Thompson, who was the longtime drummer of Genesis, you know, I had big shoes to fill. But they never made it feel like that, which was good. They kind of immediately made it feel like we're a group trying to fulfill this, and it was never kind of, you know, never felt like an outsider or something. When it's required, you can sound like Phil. And so for some of those songs, which has that just a certain sort of Phil quality about them, there's particularly notice with Duchess, Domino, it, it just, it, it does feel very easy, very natural. New York, it was a good experience, you know. Coming out of that, everyone felt that we could do it, it could work. So at that point, we said, okay, let's start planning. Being in my nature, I'd already planned possible tours and possible dates and whatever. I put together dates in the UK for November, December this year uh, with a plan that we'd rehearse now and then go straight into the tour. This was pre-COVID. And then uh, COVID came along in February. And uh, of course, that threw a complete grenade in any plans. I originally thought when we had to, to postpone that we should just put it all back a year. I thought it was a logical thing to do because give time for everything to settle out. Because at the moment, there's no way that you're going to get you know, 10,000 people in the hall sitting next to each other, chanting along to some song, you know. I sat down with the guys and said, listen, if we're going to do this, by the time we've built the set, built the stage and everything, and rehearsed everything and rehearsed the content for the screens and the camera crew and everything else, are you willing to take the gamble? I said, I'll put up my share. Tony, my Phil and Mike, you're going to put up yours. It's a roll of the dice because we don't know when we're going to go out on the road, but we should do it. So everyone voted, said, yes, OK, let's go for it. God bless them. And uh, here we are. I think if we hadn't done this now, we'd, just, we'd probably gone, do you know what, guys, it's just not meant to be. It's such a long gap, you know? So I think, will it ever happen? Will COVID ever sort of be controllable? And so it was quite a brave move to do, I think, um, but quite a nice move, you know, sort of putting a flag in the ground, saying, we're going to come out into this week with a, with, a, with a show and a tour we're sort of working to do. I mean, I did say that we wouldn't do it anymore, you know. But I also said I wouldn't go out anymore. And I did three years on and off, you know. When I played the Albert Hall and Tony came and Mike came, they both came back, you know, very enthusiastic about Nick, you know, kind of sowed the seeds a little bit as to, it'd be fun to do it again, wouldn't it? You know, I, I kind of took the bait and and then I went away, you know, on and off for like two and a half, two and a half years. This was, uh, this was looming. Obviously we have to slightly different the way Phil is not able to do all the things he used to be able to do, but I think we felt that we could still put on a good show and it'd be fun to do it. And last time we went out, we did two shows in England last time, yeah, which means we've only done two, two shows in England in the last 20 years or something, you know, and with this lineup, not since 1992 or something. So I thought that was wrong. So the idea of doing a, an English tour, or British tour at least, anyhow, was, was an important thing to do. Had a great career together over the years. Had a lot of good music, a lot of fun. And you've probably seen Phil Tony and I, and of course Daryl and now Nick, you know, there's a sort of, there's a vibe not too serious, taking a piss. I think that, that's all part of the equation, really. 
I'm going to buy you a folder box, I think. What for what? The names on top. What do you mean? Well, this is card trick. Every song is card trick, you know. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Was this the one? We could have one of those. Have an iPad, you know. We haven't got that much time, you know. <laughs> Apart from since we've been here, I haven't sung for a few months, and it does get a bit out of shape. And these songs, you know, they're not all the lowest. Some of them are up there. My daughter back in vocals, 90% on, on the albums. And live, we just never really bothered, you know, I mean, Tony and Mike will be the first to agree that, you know, that's not their strong point. It's great having Patrick and Daniel, a bit of uh, reinforcements behind. It certainly takes a weight off my shoulders, because it's, it's not the kind of thing you can do this, you know, you're talking about something you either got it or you haven't, you know, I mean, I mean, a voice, you know, you hit the ceiling. Uh, and today I hit the ceiling a lot. But tomorrow will be better. Left hand bass. Well, I like the it. Trouble with the back and arms, not a patch on us. That's the no, trouble. No, they're going to say why, why we, you know. We have to get a press <laughs> announcement. Unfortunately, <laughs> well, I'm a big on press announcement. Tour, you know? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's sad. It's great sadness to say that Banks and Motherford, yeah, yeah, you're vocal retired on. vocals. <laughs> We are, I know it would be very, very much missed. Sad, sad it was, well, it will be sorely missed. <laughs> it will be. Um, it will be, yeah. It will yeah. be. Right, so comedy, comedy I'm not show. Sure sorely, is right. <laughs> sorely yeah. heard. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks. That's good. That's, that's really good. Yeah, that's really nice. yeah. just Thank a you. couple of theme times. Well, so we're not used to hearing, hearing, hearing yeah. it up with a PA, you know what I mean? Because you, that, that yeah. bass is. Yeah. I only need to worry a little bit because obviously that's still quite a lot quieter than we're actually hearing it. It's just that bottom end, you know, I know you've got extra sort of. But I do find sometimes it's that disassociation almost with that bottom thing. Disassociation So one kind of needs to be careful to sort of. Good. Good. That's, his way, that's his way of saying more keyboards. That's what he means. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> no, sounds great. Thanks a lot. All the time. You got it. You sorted out. That's right. Tony, myself, and Phil go back a long way. Myself and Tony even further. You know, put us in a room and there's a bit of banter. We have so many references to the past. You say a certain sentence that only that Phil and Tony will get. These people have been part of my life for 50 years. You know. We all know each other so well. Most of the time, we do a lot of laughing. It's a democracy as long as we agree with Tony. <laughs> well, it's probably changed a little bit over the years, really. I mean, I was always the most um, difficult <laughs> in every sense, really, that I, I liked the music to be as challenging as we could get it, really. And the early days, that was easy because, with, particularly with Peter and with Steve, he kind of wanted it challenging, too. So he had 26 minutes on, the supper's ready. Always tried to go for things I wish we were trying a different. I like to try a different chord sequence. I wanted to try a different way of doing things. I like the idea of putting a quiet bit against a loud bit and, and an unusual sort of, you know, uh, sequencing like that. And that was very much came from me, I think, as a sort of the idea of the complexity, which some people hate and some people like, and that's what Genesis is all about. Tony's mellowed. 
I sense he's enjoying this even more so because it's, it's something he thinks hasn't played live for a long time and he thinks that this is really going to appreciate this journey. Mike quite likes making decisions, you know, so if I agree with it, then I'll just go with it. But if I disagree with it, obviously I will say something. Tony's very much more open now to trying it. I'll say, give it a try. If you'll try anything, well, that's good. You know, you may not, you pull, you pull a face, you know. When I say try, you pull a face, but actually he'll always, he'll try it now much more than he used to. Uh, probably me too, I think. We'll come back to this, let's... Uh... I had a thought last night. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Steve, just take this, let's have it. Now, you know where some of these thoughts lead, but it's the acoustic stuff. The acoustic. Yeah. Well, I've got an ear in still, man. I'll take it I'll out. I'll take it out. No, I'll take it out just for you. I'll take it out. Oh, so painful. Oh. <laughs> you know, like my dreams. Um, but starting of that, that section with that's all. Yeah. Uh, which everybody loves, you know, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of it, out of da 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 Pad chords. I mean, I was thinking, you know, not take this in the way it's meant rather than the way it might sound. You know, it's like in the air pads where there's no edge. It's just ethereal, you know. It's in the air, sorry. It's, uh, <laughs> you probably haven't heard it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Try it, try it, you never know, try it. Everybody has their own, their own position, and I think, uh, you know, like Mike and Tony, are basically, or myself, are just standing there playing, you know, and, but Phil is kind of like the entertainer, you know, the way he speaks on the mic. Now, before when he was able to move around, he was running all over the stage. He was the entertainer uh, in the band. We were just the, <laughs> the musicians. And not that he's not a musician, because he's a fantastic musician, but he's the actor on stage, you know, because, you know, he grew up in, in an acting family and uh, he was an actor when he was young and he's been in a few films. He knows how to grab an audience. You don't just need great lights and sound. You need someone that really relates to the audience. And uh, I think the average person can relate to Phil Collins. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing like the applause of an audience, you know. When I was 14, I was in Oliver on stage with the Artful Dodger every night for sort of seven or eight months. There's nothing like a Saturday night in a theatre. And you can hear the orchestra tuning up and then he, people murmuring. And suddenly the curtain goes up and it all goes quiet. And there is no substitute for that. In a way, he was always a joker. He got the best sense of humour. And it's still there. Now, much more so now than in New York. I'd be just as happy going out to a pub with him, you know, without having to do all this. <laughs> Mike is a great mediator. He runs a very cool ship. In a way, I used to be company secretary with the list and sort of the notes after we watched a live video, you know. We'd get together and discuss it, but I would be the one that would be taking notes. And now I think he, he's taken over that role, which is fine by me, you know. I think that Mike is sort of the diplomat, or he's the ambassador. He's the one in the middle that kind of brings it all together again. Well, maybe we should do this then. That's what I see in this band. Uh, they are very strong personalities, all of them. But at the same time, I never see any animosity towards each other. It's the truth. They're like brothers that have different personalities and different uh, opinions, but they get along generally. And they have their little fights every once in a while, but they're not real. They're not, it's not serious. I think we, we, we have a way of working with each other. You know? We know each other so well. That includes Daryl, obviously, who's still with us. I think that part of my role is, uh, Mike always says it to me, or Tony says, well, I, I'm the one that, that remembers all the chords to the song. And <laughs> that's funny because anytime I, I, I have to audition for something, I learn as much as I can about that, that band or that artist that I'm working with. It's a great moment actually last year when Dara was sort of hearing about possibly, you know, 
if I try something. I've got an email from Daryl saying, if you guys do get together to do something, you know, please don't forget me. As if we do it without Daryl, you know what I mean? It's a very nice feeling, you know, everyone sort of wants to get on. You haven't got any real egos. Never did, really, not even when Peter was with the band or when Phil was at his heights back in the 80s when he was a superstar that, you know, in a sense, bigger than the group, really. But within the group, it was very much sort of all of us together. And you know, certainly with Mike, Phil and I, it's been whatever you see out there. It's very much down to the three of us. It's a real band, and that's something that I never saw my dad in. I always, you know, it's weird to me, you know, being in a band that now I get to see my dad in that setting, and I'm like, oh, you know, you went through this as well, where, you know, it's, it's, it's that whole kind of dynamic. You've got to go through it, you know. You've got to rehearse every day because it gives the lighting people, the sound people. It's all got to be done and it's all got to be as seamless as it can possibly be, you know. And sometimes I just, if I could just walk off and go home, I would do, you know. I mean, when, when the voice, when you're struggling with the voice, it is, um, it's very difficult. Can't you see? Phil, I miss him drumming. That's his choice, really. You know, I'm sure, if he wanted to, I'm sure he could put the hours in to drum well enough. But it has to, be, has to come from him. I realise that, actually. I kind of pushed him early on to try and play the drums. And that's not the point. It has to come from him. You know, if he goes home, I think, and sits down for four or five weeks, plays 50 minutes a day, then half an hour a day, you know, he could get the muscles working again. But you have to want to do it. Can't you feel the I think there's a momentum thing, but I also think that's parts of it with stuff that, you know, he's been going through in his personal life. It, the delay has helped. He can kind of go a bit at a time and really commit himself and then also kind of have some time off. Obviously, I think it's difficult for him because when he's, you know, used to playing some of these songs where he's the one playing the drums, and the fact that you're not able to do that for now, I'm sure it's difficult. 
Visual at the beginning. I don't think we'd ever got a chance. We were playing these clubs, you know, these hot, sweaty clubs where any people just sort of, you know, we had lighting was done by these two guys, Alpha Centauri, who had these sort of light, you know, oil slides. And it was kind of, you couldn't really see, it was dark, you couldn't see the group, couldn't see anything, but it was sweaty and hot and it was noisy and, and it was great, you know, but you, you weren't a sort of personality in any sense, really. And um, there was a, an outlet for us then, the progressive thing suited us totally. People got used to the idea of people trying to do difficult things, and there was an audience out there for that. And uh, there's still an audience out there for that now. The Genesis music and sort of sound is quite dark and moody and powerful, so it led itself to visual interpretation. It's different for every artist, how much involvement they have with what it looks like. Genesis are very involved and always have been, but the, the difference that makes our life easier is that they're very aware of the craft of, of lighting and video presentation as much as they are in the art of it. What Tony and I probably can add is we can look at it and sort of go, that doesn't look right for the moment. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know what it is, I don't know why, it doesn't really suit the music. Um, and Patrick listens to our concept, I think. Basically, if something's right, no one says, oh, I'm not sure, you know what I mean? When it's being questioned, then you haven't got it right. I mean, the only thought there was when it went out after the middle section, it goes back to the verse again. You kept with the, the same setup, the big screen with the things. I think it needs to change at that point. Mike and I are very much, you know, we, we were very involved in that all the time. So that's a very important thing to us. When Peter was with the band, obviously he was a very strong feature of that. And after he left, we sort of carried that on, I think, with brought in the very light, which has become the kind of industry standard now in one form or another. Uh, and, you know, we've always been in the head with you first group, I think, to use so many jumbotrons within a show rather than just showing people playing. So we've always loved that kind of stuff. It's a piece of theatre, these rock shows, you know, they're two hours long and you take people on some sort of journey. The performers act themselves. They don't pretend to be anyone that they're not.
mean, in the early days, obviously, you didn't need to do massive rehearsal all the time. You just, because you'd been playing the week before, or, you know, I mean, the first, you know, up to about sort of 78, you know, we'd done, so it's about sort of eight years. We'd been touring constantly, you know, really. I mean, 250 gigs a year, I don't know, really. I mean, obviously, there's a little break, sort of hiatus after Pete left and stuff, but most of the time. So, doing so much stuff, you never needed it. And so, in, in terms of the show, that sort of like progressed slowly. Um, and then you might have a new tour where you'd reintroduce some new element. But the music didn't tend to need that much rehearsal, right, because you had to rehearse the new songs in. I think now you, you sort of almost starting from scratch all the time and you're thinking which songs you're going to do, which you can get rid of. <laughs> um, obviously, there's no new music in this set, which I think for most of the audience actually is, is something of a, of a relief, actually. <laughs> will always be relevant, actually, later on. But at the moment, it's a particularly peculiar time, really, with all the, the pandemic stuff and everything and the way people behave and, and stuff and crazy politicians around the world, you know? Well, maybe no names. Superman, where are you Say to Patrick early on, look, this is the world we live in. You know, I said, let's try and make it more contemporary. For these words apply to where we are right now. Now this is the world we live in. The, the original Land of Confusion video, we're sort of making fun of Reagan and stuff, actually. It now it looks like a beacon of light, actually, when you look back, but anyhow, that's nothing neither here nor there. But it was a humorous thing when the whole thing was sort of funny and a bit, bit light-hearted and weren't taking anything too seriously, whereas this is a much more serious video, uh, the serious kind of attempt at, at interpreting the lyric, which I think some of Mike's best lyrics, actually. Happened to have taken some pictures when London was in lockdown, so there was no nothing on the on the streets and everything. And so that we kind of used that and then work, worked from that with other ideas of you know the new roles and the beach balls to represent the past in a way, and then all of the marching men, you know, with all of the masks on, you know, which I thought was a great it was a great image. <laughs>
artist I and mean, you know if someone said it's always going to be like this and there'd be no more touring I'd be fine with that <laughs> it's a bizarre sort of situation to be in all dressed up with nowhere to go really and uh, I've had uh, a harrowing few months as well you know off the stage as well as on it, so. You know, yeah, enough said. When things do change and we can go out on and do some shows, we're gonna have to spend 10 days probably somewhere, you know, to get the voice in shape, to remind everybody what they're supposed to be doing and none of us have ever sort of lived through before which is a shame that it's like that now, you know. Um, I mean, there's an awful lot of people that are hurting. Turn on the news and you've got restaurants closing and you've got different areas of life that are being affected. And this is really just entertainment, but it's, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are hurting, you know, with the, with the, the financial squeeze Hopefully we'll be able to, to, to pull it together to, to to do shows, but I mean we could you know we could be sitting here for another nine months to a year waiting for this either a vaccine or it's a shame really. It's important to call out the road crew. They've had the same life for a long time. Including Michelle and Alan and I got Steve Prime and little Jeff's been there forever, you know. These are all part of the equation. And seeing them all there together is a nice feeling for me, you know. I sort of feel comfortable around them and flight cases. I feel at home. Um. <laughs> the last tour, it was sort of verging ideas, whereas this time round, they developed the ideas and made it better. We started off saying, well, it's pretty straightforward. We have the video screen and we don't show the lights until the very last number and we turn it all around and just blow people's minds. But I think it was Mike who said, when we first saw this and, and right at the beginning of rehearsals, we were able to go through each number and saying, this is roughly how we see it. And it was Mike who said, I think you're missing a trick. I don't think you have to hold back on those big lighting panels. Because I'm sure there's ways that you can reveal a little bit of them before you get to the end. And that was probably the biggest development. You know, it reflects what we are. You know, we've always taken trouble over it. We try to be innovative as well as being and tasteful. And it's very important to make everything fit with the show. And I've seen light shows where, you know, the, the, the band has obviously had no interest in what's, what's being done for them. And it's completely ridiculous. And you start right from word, word one, it's all flashing and everything's happening. We try to build and take it down and stuff. And people who work with us understand that. Um, and it's very important, it's got to really enhance the song. You know, you're always trying to get a mood for a song, you go for colours, you go for intensity, you go for flashbang, and whatever the song requires. We have each other here that night. We
Domino is a journey, you know, it's the most dramatic piece of music and it has these huge highs and huge lows. And it's a fairly obvious conceit that we, we interpret that using Domino's. Treatment Studios, who, who are the video company, who made a lot of the content for us. They've taken us on this amazing journey. And for that, we don't need to keep putting pictures of keyboards or guitars or even singers. You know, we can allow that story to be told simply on the big screen. are used in various ways, particularly in the video, as buildings, um, which is one thing, which is I originally sort of set the thing in Beirut when I was thinking about it, and Beirut has buildings that look a bit like dominoes, I suppose. And then the other thing is they do look like, in this video, a bit like tombstones at time as well. Um, and since the song is all about Beirut at the time, which was being bombed and people were being killed, and the effects of what one person was doing somewhere, like an American president making a decision, which had this effect on some poor chap somewhere, and he was, you know, he was killed or his wife was killed or whatever. And that was what it was all about, really. So the tombstones is another factor. So to call it just the last domino would have been a bit kind of morbid. There's a question mark, a bit more lightweight. And, you know, you can interpret it how you like. Of all this stuff, you know, there's things. Sometimes things just happen for us in a way. You know, it, it, it's amazing. I think, um, and everyone will tell you that luck is a crucial thing in this. You do know, the right moment, you do the right thing. You sometimes can't put your finger on where where things went. But it was a very slow build for us. You know, it's ten years before we had our first hit single. You know, that, that's worth remembering that. And we've released about well, quite a few before that. And um, and that 
was a very significant moment, you know. I think because although the albums were doing well, it meant you were sort of underground group, which is which we're very happy to be. But I think you could only live that long as an underground group to be a group that lasts for sort of 30, 40, 50 years. You've got to have hits. We're going to have a show next week, end of this week. We're excited about, it. so we want to do it. You have to wait a bit longer than planned. We'll wait. Whereas if we hadn't done this, I think we'd have just gone off the boil, you know. Be the putting it to bed, you know, the last time. It's, it's when it's good, it's great fun, and the audience always seem to come away um, having enjoyed it. So really, it's it's a question of going out there and doing what you do with your life. You know, I mean, it's I'm 70 in January, and I've been in this band since I was 19 you know, since Nick's age. Whenever my dad, you know, was feeling a bit down, we'd go and play a show, I would see his mood light up because when you have 20,000 people in an arena who are all there because they absolutely love you, it's a feeling that I think is so important for musicians to kind of realize that what they do and what they did still matters. And you know I know, babe, that I don't wanna go. The, the, the road itself is kind of, not, not sort of nostalgia feeding for it. When you're actually doing it, you're not sure how much you're enjoying it, but when you're not doing it, you kind of have a, a memory of it, you know, which is, and when I go to other people's shows and I go backstage, I get that sort of feeling inside, you know, like to be back doing it again. The instant reaction to things that you've written is very exciting, I think. I goes back so long that and they enjoy each other's company and what else are we going to do in our lives we don't do this we do gardening the songs we've done over the years people's lives tie into certain songs they you know that that's their songs when they married someone fell out with somebody that, that, that ties into their life and so i think it, it, it's a connection for them i think Given me a fantastic life, and I kind of, um, in, in, a, in a way, I perhaps didn't originally think it would. It was a sort of hobby, and then it became, it took over. Really. <laughs> I've been everything we've done up until now. It's been, it's been such incredibly good fun, and appreciated by me, the, the, the fans, the music. Our togetherness. So anything now is, is a plus as well, good. It? I think they should thank me for putting up with them, and I should thank them for putting up with me. <laughs> See ya.
I don't know what a, what a perfect show would be, but I thought that our last show was 13 years ago. But um, probably the perfect show would be to end here, where the guys are from. You got to end on a high note, and this might be the perfect last tour.